Memoirs of the Life and Character of Rev. John Elliott, Apostle of the N.A. Indians, by Martin Moore, printed in Boston, 1822. Prefix. The compiler of this little work being stationed on the ground where Elliot planted his first Indian church and organized his first Indian town, has naturally felt a deep interest in his character. I have looked through most of the publications that treat of the early history of New England, collected what facts I could concerning him, and arranged them in the order in which they will be found in the following pages. I have related them principally in the language of Eliot himself and his contemporaries. The phaseology may perhaps be considered as antiquated and repulsive to the refinement of modern taste, but I presume that many readers will not be displeased to see the aged Eliot clothed in the garb of his own times. In the course of the narrative, I have taken occasion to intersperse a few observations and reflections of my own. In drawing his character as a missionary and in concluding remarks, I have endeavored to encourage exertions uh, to civil and evangelize the tribes of our Western folks. This little work, with all its imperfections on its head, is now presented to the Christian public. Imperfect as it is, yet, believing that it contains more facts related to the trials, labors, and success of Mr. Ellett than, than are to be found in any single publication, I hope it will be interesting to the antiquity and useful to the Christian. Memoirs of Rev. John Ellett Chapter 1 Conversion and Early Days of Ellett the Rev. John Elliot was born at Nacine, Essex County, England, in 1604. We have not been able to obtain much knowledge of his ancestors. There is nothing related of his parents except that they gave him a liberal education and were exemplary in their piety. I do see, says this excellent man, that it was a great favor of God to me, that my first years were seasoned with the fear of God, the word and prayer. When Mr. Elliot left the University of Cambridge, he became a teacher of youth, and while he led children and youth in the paths of virtue, acquired also a knowledge of the human heart. In his early years, he became acquainted with Mr. Hooker, footnote, Thomas Hooker, minister of Hartford, and father of the Connecticut churches. He was preeminently distinguished as a preacher and a writer and as a man of piety, and a footnote, who was instrumental in leading him into the right knowledge of the doctrines and duties of religion. In the year 1631, Mr. Elliot arrived at Boston, and the succeeding year, November 5, 1632, was settled as teacher of the church in Roxbury. Governor Winthrop says, Mr. John Elliot, a member of Boston Congregation, whom the company intended presently to call to the office of teacher, was called to be a teacher to the company at Roxbury, and though Boston labored all they could, both with the congregation at Roxbury and with Mr. Elliot himself, alleging their want of him and the covenant between them, yet he would not be diverted from accepting the call at Roxbury, so he was dismissed. When Mr. Elliot came to Boston, there was no officiating minister in that place. Mr. Wilson had gone back to England, and the religious service was carried on by Governor Winthrop, Mr. Dudley, and Mr. Noel, the ruling elder. Mr. Hubbard says, these men accepted the charge, knowing well that the princes of Judah in King Hezekiah's reigns were appointed to teach the people out of the law of God. Mr. Wilson left Boston the latter end of March 1631. Mr. Elliot arrived November following, with the governor's lady and sixty other persons in the ship line. He immediately joined the Boston church 
and preached with them till he settled at Roxbury. The prior engagement of Mr. Elliot to settle with the people at Roxbury, who came over with him in the same ship, and to whom he was warmly attached, was sufficient to satisfy his friends of the church in Boston, and they gave him a regular dismission. He was accordingly united with the church at Roxbury, as their teacher and Mr. Weld was called the next year to be their pastor. Before Mr. Elliot left England, he had engaged himself to a worthy young lady who followed him to America. The next year, where they were married in October 1632, the wife of his youth, says Dr. Matter, with his accustomed but agreeable quaintness, lived with him until she became the staff of his age, and she left him not until about three or four years before his departure to those heavenly regions, where they are now together see light. She was a woman very eminent both for holiness and joyfulness, and she excelled most of the daughters that have done virtuously. God made her a blessing not only to her family, but to her neighborhood, and when at last she died, I heard and saw her aged husband, who else very rarely wept, yet now with tears over her coffin before the good people, a vast concourse of whom had come to her funeral, say, Here lies my dear, faithful, pious, prudent, praying wife. I shall go to her, and she shall not return to me. My reader will of his own accord excuse me from bestowing any further epithets upon this gracious woman. Six children were the fruit of the marriage, five sons and one daughter. The daughter and one of the sons survived the parents. Three sons died young. Their father had dedicated them all to the work of the ministry, and one of these three who bore their parents' names had lived to become a zealous and able preacher both to the settlers and the Indians and died in the triumph of his faith. Footnote. This son of the apostolic uh, Eliot was the first minister of Newton. His ability and uh, acceptation in the ministry were said to be preeminent. Under the direction of his father to be obtained considerable proficiency in the English, uh, Indian language and was an assistant to him in the missionary employment until he settled at Newton. Even after his ordination there, he imitated the manner of his father, devoted himself to the instruction of the Indians, as well as his own flock. Accordingly, he preached steadily once in a fortnight to them at P-E-Q-U-I-M-M-E-N-E-T, uh, Stalton, and sometimes at uh, Natick. Mr. Homer's uh, History of Newton, and a footnote. All his children gave such satisfactory evidence of piety that our Elliot venerably in years and virtues would say, I have had six children, and I bless God for his free grace. They are all either with Christ or in Christ, and my mind is now at rest concerning them. And when some asked him how he could bear the death of such excellent children, he meekly replied, My desire was that they should serve God on earth. But if God will choose rather to have them serve him in heaven, I have nothing to object against it. His will be done. His youngest son, Benjamin, was many years his assistant in the ministry, and as a son with his father served him in the gospel. He also died before his father. His third son, Joseph, survived him and maintained the character of an eminent minister. End of chapter 1, having been read by Peter John Parisis.